John Strohmeyer, welcome to Legally Contented. Please introduce yourself to our audience. Hey, Wayne. Thanks for having me on. I am John Strohmeyer. I am the proprietor of Strohmeyer Law in Houston, Texas, where I guide my clients through the maze of estate planning, probate, and tax law. John, thank you for taking time out of your day to chat with me. The reason I asked you to join me is because I think you are doing interesting things with your referral marketing and your branding through two podcasts that you host and publish and produce. But before we get into podcasts and the nitty gritty of your referral marketing and branding efforts, can you step back and give us a little bit of a background as to who you are and how you got to where you are today? Sure. So obviously I went to law school, uh, now, I went to UT Law for undergrad, then got my J, or after getting my JD, got my LLM in tax from NYU. Before that, I'd worked for four years, mostly as the night manager of the Austin Four Seasons Hotel. So what I've got is this first career working in hospitality that I brought to my practice, which focuses on tax, estate planning, and probate. What that means is, well, you know, I don't have a whole lot of conflict in my practice, I do zero litigation. It allows me really to focus on how do we take care of clients? What are we doing to make it easy for them to leave no unfinished business? When you left your career at the Four Seasons and you entered private practice, which by the way, was what two, three law firms before you launching your own firm, how did you start to take those customer service lessons, client service lessons from the Four Seasons and implement them in law firms, at law firms, that perhaps were not as progressive as you might have hoped and perhaps were not as uh, embracing of client service as your firm might be today? It was, it's interesting because it was push and pull. The, I remember the first firm I worked at, like just about every law firm, thinks that they do a really good job of client service. You know, we're going to be on top of emails. We're going to, you know, have fancy offices. When you show up, we'll have engraved glassware. That That is what service is. I disagree. So I had this first meeting when I, my first off, it, I had a meeting about a week or two into my first job at that first law firm. And the office manager just kind of sat there and politely humored me and said, okay. And really, they never took anything to heart. And to be fair, I didn't really know what to offer at that point. I did need to work in law firms for a little bit before it really started crystallizing that law firms typically focus on aspects of service that come out of you know Four Seasons, Ritz, Disney, the high-end service models. But people go to Four Seasons, Ritz, and Disney for very different reasons than they go to see their lawyer. You know, you're going to those places because if you had a free Saturday and an unlimited budget, those are some really good options. <laughs> if you've got a free Saturday, nobody says, I'm going to go visit my lawyer. You know, you're, you're going to Disney and Four Seasons for some combination of entertainment, pampering, and fun. You're just not going to do that with a lawyer or a doctor or an engineer or an accountant. And this is one of those big problems that I saw is, we're focused on the wrong aspects and there's nothing wrong with having that entertainment and pampering and fun, but nobody is going to come to your law firm because you have the fanciest offices or you are you know, offering some fancy drink menu. You know, it's just, it's a different thing. People come to a lawyer to solve a problem. They, they have some needle they need moved. And sure, it's nice if you have good drinks or great coffee, or maybe you get them a gift, but that's not what they're really plunking their money down on the table for. They want you to solve a problem for them. And everything that you do that takes away from that is really a waste of your time, effort, and their money. So what does Four Seasons level, Rich Carlton level client service look like in the context of a law firm, and we'll call it you know, a general, either direct to consumer law firm or even a business to business law firm. We're still dealing with people as lawyers talking to our clients. Make that transition. How do you take that that Rich Carlton Four Seasons esque level of client service and mold it into what is appropriate for a law firm? Right. And so here's where I'm going to say, you know, as with any lawyer answer, it's going to depend, and it's going to depend on the type of practice you have. You know, again, I'm working in a in an estate planning and probate firm. 
the way I set things up, the way I do things, is necessarily going to be different than a PI firm or a criminal defense or a family law firm. It doesn't mean that you don't still want to take care of people, but what you're looking at is, you know, the implementation is going to be different. We'll think about some of the same things, but for example, you know, most of my clients are coming from referrals. While it's not absolutely necessary that they talk to me immediately, me, the lawyer, if somebody call, calls in, they don't need to talk to me immediately. They can wait a few days. For a PI firm, I know it is imperative that those firms, criminal defense as well, like if they don't start talking to a lawyer very quickly, they're like the business model is different. So if you hear something, you say, well, that doesn't work in my firm. It, it probably doesn't. But let's take it back. The overarching thing I want to look for is how are we making it easy for our clients to move the needle on their problem? You know, again, they're coming to us with a problem. We need to figure out how to make it easy. For me as an estate planner, and I'm doing complicated taxable estate planning, I need my clients to understand what they're choosing. You know, they're coming in, almost all of them say, well, look, this is simple. You know, if my spouse dies, leave it all, or if I die, leave it all to my spouse. If my spouse dies, then we're leaving it to the kids in equal shares. And 99% of my clients come in and say, we're simple, this is all we have to do. An hour and a half later, after we've dug into exactly what that looks like, they understand, look, it's, it is still basically simple, but that initial reading they had on their situation is like the four-year-old's Crayola drawing of a house. Like it's a good idea, but you can't go build a house based on that. So my job is to make it easy to figure out, well, what's important when something happens to one of them, are we going to lose access to something? How do we make it easy for them? And again, that's how my process gets set up. When you get into other areas of law that I clearly can't talk <laughs> substantially correctly about, you know, family law, I'm, I don't know what happens. I, I don't file motions other than non-contested <laughs> probate motions. I'm out of my element, but the fact remains, your clients need to know what you're doing and how you're going to get them there. How can you bring your expertise to what it is they're looking for? And this is so much of what it is. It, you know, again, or again, for the first time, every client, every customer, every guest, when they go and purchase something from a business, they're buying a combination of three things. A physical component, you know, the stuff you can pick up and touch. They're buying some sort of technical expertise. And then finally, there's the service or the experience portion of it that they're paying for. Now, there's going to be a different mix for every business. You know, if, when I go and buy a Lego set, that's primarily the physical product. They're going to try and adjust that and drive up value. They're, they're adding their technical expertise. Whatever their formula is, the engineering that goes behind it, the intellectual property rights that they secure for you know, Guardians of the Galaxy, Lord of the Rings, whatever it may be, and clearly I purchased because I can run all those off. <laughs> that drives up the value, but that's a technical expertise. It's not, uh, you know, it's some bit of intellectual capital they have that comes under that expertise component. It's harder for them to drive up the service component. Why? You're buying a thing. At the end of the day, it doesn't matter how much service they put into it, you want the thing, and that's okay. You're trying to buy the thing. When we move over to lawyers and doctors and accountants and engineers, and you're primarily buying that technical expertise component, you know, knowing how to do a thing, knowing what the tools are that will achieve a result. When you move over to Four Seasons and Disney, you're buying the service component, you know, being taken care of. How is it done for you? And so when we think about this, lawyers were primarily hired for that expertise. It doesn't mean we can't drive up some value by making the physical things that we provide to our clients better. You know, having nicer paper to sign things on, or you drive up with service, responding faster. You can do that, but it, there's no way you're going to goose the physical component or the service component enough to overwhelm you being hired to solve a problem. You know, nobody's going to say, oh my God, you know, if you think about 
Google reviews that we're looking for. If somebody had left a Google review for your firm and it said they had the best coffee or they had the best <laughs> massages, you know, it, it's just not what we're hired for. And if we try and get around it by saying, well, you know, we we made sure and we had their favorite drink, even though it was some weirdo flavor of moxie that we had to import from seven states over, it just is out of kilter with why people actually hire you. You know, we're not procurement agents for our clients. We're here to move the needle. And yes, we can make it easier for them. We can make it a more comfortable experience if we have, you know, diet lemon lime moxie from, you know, the one brewery or the one bottling plant outside of Boston that makes that weirdo flavor. But that's not why they hired a lawyer. You know, they could order it if they really wanted it. As people can tell, you've got some strong thoughts and feelings about client service. I'm curious, after spending half a decade or about half a decade of Four Seasons, how much were you allowed slash able to treat the firms and your roles at those firms before launching your own law firm? How much were you able to treat those firms and your experience as a laboratory for these ideas and the service that you act, that you eventually provide at Strohmeyer Law? Because... I would, I would like to think that clearly you were able to see the connection between your time at Four Seasons and the law you were doing. I'm also assuming you were an associate, so it's not like you were able to move the needle like you do with your clients. Right. You weren't really able to move the needle with client service too far at your firms when you were more junior. But were you able to, for lack of a better term, beta test these ideas you had? You could have the philosophy. You could see the world a particular way. But if you can't test those ideas out, then they're just theories and they're not actual rules or, or policy. So talk a little bit about how you were able, to, if at all, to test out that uh, these ideas in your old firms and, and how much of that urge to do so led to you launching Strohmeyer Law. Right. So this is a really good question. I, when I started out, I'd worked at three firms before I launched my own, each for right around three years. Now the first firm, basically uh, fell apart and it was time for me to go. The second firm, there was not enough work for me. And so then I moved to the third firm where that was the one where I finally had the chance and I was developing enough of my own business that I could say, all right, I can see that I am not going to you know, die cold, penniless and broke uh, on the streets if I jump out and do this by myself. The first firm, you know, I was still getting, just figuring out how do I even lawyer? Like all of us, you know, I came out of law school, sure. even though I had all this technical knowledge, just, you know, how do you take care of something? How do you get a client in the door? I was too busy learning how to run the firm. And at that point, I was mostly just absorbing, all right, well, this is what a high-end firm does. This is, you know, they were sending out gifts all the time. They were doing all sorts of things. It's like, all right, well, does this make a difference? The second firm was a 110 attorney firm. They had a lot of things going on. The estate planning practice I was part of was a, was a bonus feature. And what I saw there, you had a lot of different practices moving in a lot of different ways. And so it was interesting to see how it was done. But as you mentioned, I was still an associate. I could get a few little clients here and there, but it didn't make sense. And it was mostly a, you know, good work, but you don't really need to bother. You know, I'd, I'd have some of the other associates come and ask me questions, clearly because I was the only one who knew some of these answers at their level. But it wasn't really a chance for me there. And it was once I got to that third firm, so a combination of I've been to two firms before, I've seen how it's worked there, I see how it works here. I also know that I've got some leeway, you know, when you do work for partner one, Partner two doesn't like that and wants it done exactly the opposite <laughs> way, even though they're at the same firm. So you're having to remember, you know, partner one, partner one's rules, partner two's rules, partner three's rules. If you ever do anything for partner four, who knows what the rule will be. It probably depends on the client and the day of the week. So just seeing a bunch of different ways of doing things, that helped. And it was at that point that I had enough kind of cachet by myself to start bringing in clients who were more than just, oh, do a simple will, and, you know, you're a friend, so I'm gonna charge you next to nothing for it. I was bringing in 
people I'd never met before to do work that was paying tens of thousands of dollars. Like, this is great. Okay, like this is proving that I know what I'm doing, technically. And it really was, all right, I could do those little experiments. Like, hey, what if I do it this way? And not only that, and not only just the server side, but how do I make life easier for me? I started using a program uh, called Text Expander. It's something where you could type in shorter code snippets. So like use pound sign DTE and it outputs today's date. You don't have to think about it. You just remember that. So I don't have to remember exactly how to spell November or anything odd, anything odd like that. It just shoots it out automatically perfectly every time. So I'd start doing, you know, I could get my time entries done faster. I wasn't handwriting out, you know, attention to blah, 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 blah. I would shoot out, you know, pound or type out pound TCW and it would say telephone call with prompt me for a name. And then the nine or 10 words that would cover just about everything, you know, telephone call with Bill Smith to discuss pending documents and whatever else. And it just cut down on the time. So I was able to churn through things faster. So it was these little experiments where I was like, oh, this is going to work. I could start, I figured out how to start using Calendly to schedule calls. So I wasn't wasting time or wasting an assistant's time trying to get me scheduled time. It was here, this is a tool that's going to make it faster and easier for me. It's going to make it faster and easier for the clients, whether that client is an actual client. So scheduling with Calendly or the client who is the partner, you know, I'm getting my time entries done on a faster basis because at the end of the day, all I have to do is, you know, a few codes to cover almost everything. And then the times in there, it's typed correctly. So my assistant doesn't have to review it and waste her time doing that or translating my garbage handwriting. It's just done and we're, we're done faster. So th lots of little things here and there, no one big, no one thing at a time but all of it kind of combines and then it builds on itself. Oh, and I totally agree that, that life is a series of, of little things that, that kind of compound and get built upon to become big things. And when you own a business, I think you start to see how much client service, marketing, the actual doing of the work, it's all interrelated. And when you can be efficient with one of those three things, you can find ways to improve the others, you know, meaning if you're efficient with how you provide client service in terms of, like you said, text expander or document automation or, or what have you, then that frees you up to do more time, to spend more time on things that you can't, um, automate or that you can't scale up. You have to have coffee with people. You can't send out your avatar yet to have those coffees. Um, but let's talk a little bit about the marketing because we danced around that a bit and I'm curious. You mentioned it when you were at that third firm before you left uh, bef to, bef to start your own, but tell me a little about your, your marketing tactics, the client related work versus the referral related work. As we start to talk more about or get into the podcasting, when you've got a firm and a practice group, or should I say a practice area that seems to be more referral focused, I'm also curious how you balance the client facing marketing and referral marketing, because if you've got the 80, 20 rule and you know, 80% of your clients might be coming in through referrals, then how much can you get away with not focusing on referrals exclusively and, and taking away to make sure the, the client facing stuff looks like it's normal and what a client would expect. Right. And so for my practice, most of it is referral based. I'm looking, you know, mostly coming from CPAs, financial advisors, or other lawyers who don't do what I do. So a lot of it is, well, how do I get in front of these other people so they know if something goes wrong or when their clients need this, I need to make sure and take care of them. And this is where we'll talk more about the, the different podcasts and how it gets there, but I'm looking at producing content that works for them. They're, I mean, to think about it in a different way, there's typically broken down or marketing gets broken down into either B2B or B2C, business to business or business to consumer. Mine, because of the referral nature, it's marketing as B2B. So I'm marketing to these other businesses. Here is information about what we're doing or what you could use 
to make it easier for your clients, for you to recognize a potential threat to your clients one way or another. But the clients obviously were, you know, are, if you look at just who our clients are, it's B to C, like I'm bringing in individuals who are spending their money on my services. So it's this hybrid of if I can use something that's going to be good enough for the other advisors, it's technical enough that they can pull something out of it but it'll still get some more usage from the clients who are either you know prosumers they want to know a little bit more doctors and engineers typically want to know more about how the things work than other clients having them have something they can engage with or if it just works in such a way that it'll help us be seen better either through google maps or just through normal SEO stuff. So we think about it kind of in both ways. I need to focus on the content that's going to help clients either directly or it's going to help my clients indirectly because I'm teaching their CPA or their financial advisor, ad, their financial advisor about this is how this thing works or beware of this tax result. Or I mean, just this morning, I sent out an email to an email list that I'm on of CPAs, tax attorneys here in Texas who are focused on a particular niche, we've got a new uh, reporting requirement that's going to start in 2024 for all entities. They're going to have to file something with the uh, Financial Crimes Enforcement Network Department of the Treasury. And here was a video I put together of a speech I've given about five or six times. I put the video on YouTube. Here's a link to the video on YouTube. We have the video also embedded on the website, so that drives more you know, more good looks from Google and just helps overall. But this is a video where I'm giving away just about everything I know about this new reporting requirement to these other advisors so they know what to do. There's not a whole lot of work for me or anyone else when this reporting requirement comes in. You know, once you learn how to do it, you can pretty much do it. There's not going to be much of a reason, I think at least at this point, for me to come in and kind of save the day on doing this work for other people. Who knows? You know, once, once it actually goes into effect, I may be swamped with all of this work. But that still reminds people, hey, John sent out this email. You know, obviously it's got all my contact information on there. It went to about 100 other folks they're going to see it they're going to understand like oh this is this is a thing to think about and hopefully it triggers more views on youtube and you know the the beneficial marketing cycle continues and i think that's an important point here with referral marketing is that we often think about educating our clients and educating through blog posts or podcasts or videos our clients but referral sources shouldn't just be made aware of things you're doing with clients that could be uh, helpful to their own clients. They should be educated about the issues that could impact them because it also helps them look good. And they're going to remember that John told us about this new regulation, this new re reporting requirement, and no one else has told us that. The other attorneys who we know emailed us Christmas recipes or right. told us about, you know, a $5 million recovery they got in a case that's just not relevant to the referral source. So being able to focus what you are saying onto what your clients or referral sources care about. And I, I tell clients all the time of mine, let's look at a Venn diagram. And if you think about one circle is the things that you know, and that your practice focuses on the other circle is the things that your clients, your referral sources know, I should say your referral sources know, and that they care about. And when you overlap those circles, you've got some, some middle ground there that can be things that you know, and that you care about that impact the things that your referral sources know and care about and the, the value of being a resource for them, especially when they pick up the phone and they go, Hey, John, I got your email last week. I'm curious. Do you know X, Y, Z? And you taking five minutes mm -hmm. to answer that question is the equivalent of you spending an hour with them at dinner or two hours at a ball game or over coffee or breakfast. You can build relationships in all different ways. And what's great about the content side, the content marketing and thought leadership side of referral marketing is you can do it at scale. You just said you sent the email out to a hundred people. That's a hundred people or so who are learning from you. That's a hell of a lot less of an investment for you than going to a hundred coffees or a hundred dinners, both time and money, but it's educational. And, and that is not to say that 
there's no room for networking because I think content in this instance when it comes to referral marketing is like the air support for the ground game, the ground battle that is handshaking, kissing babies, meeting people face to face, but you can't do it at scale. And the content educates and can be done at scale. And so on, on that note, let's talk about the, the podcast here because you've got a ref, what I think is a referral marketing based podcast and more of a kind of personal branding podcast where neither are you just simply riffing into a microphone for an hour. You're interviewing guests and you're, you're tackling a range of subjects that are covered underneath the umbrella of both podcasts. So talk a little bit about why you decided to launch your podcast of all the content creation methods you could have gone to. What about podcasts drew you and why these two in particular, these two directions for the podcast? Well, I started with podcasts. I've got two now and I'll go into a little bit more later. It was something like I'm a podcast super user. I listen to them all the time. For me, it's you know as valuable as reading books, but it's more like I can do it while you know, folding laundry. I can do it while running, and I can just get a faster stream of information, whether it's news or you know, I listen to podcasts on some of my favorite TV shows. I'm a big fan of, well, can't think of the words right now. Big fan of George R. R. Martin's Song of Ice and Fire, otherwise known as Game of Thrones. There are a lot of podcasts where, even though he hasn't released a book in years that is in the main storyline, these folks have one to two hours of content every week wow. of just every year for the last few years talking about the stories that are embedded in there and what do we pull out of that and how can we see like it. So it's a medium that I was already familiar with and enjoyed. And so I was like, oh, well, this is easy. Like, I know I should be, you know, writing a blog, but writing a blog is hard and it takes more time. Having the conversations with people about what they know, how can we draw out what it is they're looking for so that we can figure out some of the pieces of the puzzle? And then that gets into, well, what are the two podcasts I've got? The first one I started is Five Star Council. It is how I wanted to get out there the you know, the harsh thoughts that I've had on client service for lawyers, here we are 110 or so episodes in, it helped me refine my thinking in the same way that sitting down and writing does, but I've had probably 80 different conversations with people. I've had a number, you know, 15 or 20 just solo shot episodes. In the, in the beginning, I was going through, here's what I think about this, kind of pull it back together. By the time I got to episode 66, I'd really, really concentrated and filtered down exactly what I thought. You heard a lot of it <laughs> earlier. And now, you know, and then we went back and we had another 30 or so more interviews. At episode 100, took a chance to say, all right, we're going to take a break here. What we're working on right now is it's going to end up being about 13 to 15 episodes just walking through, like, how do you actually improve client service in your firm? For a while, I'd been asking the question, well, what would a law firm built by the founders of Disney Four Seasons and Amazon look like? You know, these are the companies we think about for great service. Well, what does that look like? And, you know, we spent 100 episodes trying to draw out some of those threads of what does it look like. And based on that, we're now worked on working on this is how you build it. This is, these are the steps you need to go through. This is how you can go in and tweak things. So yesterday we recorded the episode just on how you make minor improvements here and there. Where are you going to find the ideas? What does that look like? The next time we record, we're going to be recording on how do you recover from mistakes? These are just the things that I, you know, filtered it in, picked it up automatically from four years at the four seasons. It's not obvious. It seems so obvious. And so many people just want to pick up the answers of, well, I stayed at these fancy hotels and I see what they do. So I can just mimic that. And it's not. So the, to bringing it back to your actual question. Yeah, it is mostly personal branding. I don't do any, you know, I do some consulting, but it's not something that's going to threaten me working at my law firm anytime soon. It's mostly for fun. And while there is some benefit to it. It's here. Look, I, I can say I'm the worldwide leader in client service issues for lawyers because I don't know anybody else who's talking about this. 
And, uh, and I was going to ask you, I was going to ask you what, what the point was of that podcast because branding is great and to be perceived as the the worldwide leader with apologies to espn the worldwide leader in client service for law firms that that is notable and and that is noble you you could actually you could literally help law firms help even more people help society by becoming a better client focused uh organization institution whatever you want to call it but in terms of more granular and more kind of closely related to your law firm's operations, what did you hope that five star council could lead to referrals from people? Could you hope that it would lead to people wanting to hire you to coach? You mentioned that you're doing a little bit of consulting, but not a lot. I'm just curious for people who are listening and saying, well, that's really cool to be known as an expert and authority, but that's an expert or an authority regarding business operations of a law firm and not the substance of the law that John actually practices. So, what were you trying to achieve through that? So, podcast? yeah, I mean, it really did start out as this is a passion project. I need to get this idea out of my head because there were things that were rattling around and I could happily go in and walk, you know, walk into a restaurant or a hotel with people and just point things out and say, like, you're not noticing that they're doing this right now. And that thing is either good or bad or indifferent. But just, you know, notice that that's happening. And I say, oh, wow, that that is Interesting. I mean, the the real revelation came when I went to dinner at Commander's Palace during a uh, CleoCon a few years ago, and just sitting there and pointing out, like, you see that ribbon? That means something. I don't know exactly what, but we'll ask our server when it comes back. And the balloons mean something different. And like, there's an interaction. Or notice that when he was talking, he slightly came in and moved the salt and pepper shakers, and that's a signal to other people. And just little things that you may notice, but you if you haven't worked in high-end service, you probably wouldn't pick up on or even realize it. And it it's like knowing how a magic trick works. Just because you know how he got that torn car, uh, corner of your card inside the orange, it doesn't take away from the skill of having done that. You know, you may not, you know, clearly it's, it's not presto changeo, you know, smoke ball, and then everything is magic. There is a lot of skill in being able to do it that well. That's what I'm just trying to expose. It's, it's so much of this can be so straightforward. So why did I do this? Sure, it started as passion project, but one of the jokes I, I kind of make throughout many of our interviews is it's free public consulting for me. You know, I get to talk to, you know, I've worked up to the point where I can, I've had some pretty big names on, at least people I was like, oh my God, they responded to me. I I had the former uh, VP of operations for Disney World on and just having him talk about what it was like running Disney World. You know, this is a massive totally. operation and just getting some of the ideas out of his head is great. Um, Joe Pine was recently on, he wrote The Experience Economy. And his was a really useful book that I read probably four or five years ago that helped crystallize some of the ideas. Now, his idea on experience and my ideas on service are like two, two sides of a coin. The service is what the business is doing. The experience is what the client receives. So you can't have one without the other. And not everything lines up, but you don't need everything to perfectly match up. Not every idea has to perfectly line up, but it's really helpful to understand that there are these two parts and I'm focused on what the business is doing versus the kind of overwhelming response that's going into the client as the experience. But even just being able to talk to him, hear some ideas, because you know, my podcast producer works for me, does my marketing work, just having him sit there and hear the interview as he, you know, he's gonna go back and edit it as well, it's coming up with ideas of, well, how are we thinking about this? How are we using what information we're pulling out of this podcast? So, I mean, even if it's just that I have this, you know, small bit of cash or cachet from, because uh, there's not a lot of cash from it, a uh, small bit of cachet from, you know, being locally famous within certain sects of the legal community, we have some sponsorships that provide some money. Uh, I get some free uh, 
conference admissions. Like it's not big dollars, but being able to talk and get that public facing consulting, you know, direct from the source, like, hey, we're doing this and having the my guests be like, yeah, that, you could do that or you could think about it this way. That's really valuable. So it's almost like, you know, get free consulting that I'm doing in public. And if it helps other people, I'm happy to do that one. It's interesting, too, that you can't always ascribe an ROI to everything you do, but there, that doesn't mean there's not value. And being able to be known as someone in the industry who has these views and has this expertise, it can open doors for you that might not lead to huge money bags being deposited, dropped off on your office uh, desk anytime soon, but one day they could. Because one right. door opens up another door, opens another door. And next thing you know, you are speaking at a conference that you could only have dreamed of. Or you've got someone from Disney World or from the Rich Carlton who is on your podcast because you kind of have this cumulative effect of content, this cumulative effect of authority where you get out there and you keep telling people what you're good at. You show them that you know what you're talking about. And slowly that builds up and it leads to good things that not might – those good things might not always mean new clients in the door, but that isn't the only uh, marker of success and of of um, evidence that your content marketing and thought leadership marketing efforts are paying off. I want to ask about no unfinished business, but I, I can't help myself. I want to dance around this rabbit hole without hopefully you pulling me in it. I'm very curious. <laughs> As the client service guy in in the law for law firms, do you ever have a concern or, or a concern that clients might come to you, they see this information somehow, they do their research, and it's like, okay, client service guy, give me client service. Like they, right. they might have an outsized expectation because this guy is talking about the Four Seasons, he's got a guy from Disney on his podcast. I'm just curious, do you ever have to wrestle with like unrealistic expectations because you've done such a good job of becoming an right. authority regarding client service that people expect like chocolates and free robes that are monogrammed you know, when they walk in and sign a retainer letter? I mean, I'm happy to start charging people more if that's what they want, <laughs> but clients don't want gifts. But to your point, there are people, whether or not they've actually said that, I'm holding myself to a very high standard. I was talking to a referral source a couple of days ago, and he had he thought I was kind of out of the range of his clients, but we were talking about the people, you know, he was really upset that the person he had been sending the some of his uh, estate planning to had just disappeared. It had been four months, no contact from this lawyer. The bar, thankfully, is pretty low if it's not <laughs> on the ground for client service for lawyers. So at least for now, you know, we we track, you know, when was the last time we talked to every client we're meeting? You know, we're doing our family status meetings to just go over all the clients every week. And we track how long has it been since somebody actually contacted this person. If it's been more than a week, we need, you know, somebody needs to be on top of this. And that really helps drive it. So, yes, uh, we we hold ourselves to a higher standard. Uh, I hold I hold us to a very high standard of how do we take care of people, how do we make it easy for them, and how do we just help them get things done? Because it really is. Sometimes people forget. You know, I was like, oh yeah, you know, for estate planning, there's rarely any urgency to this. We're trying to get them through the door. We want them done. So if we can be at least as motivated as they are, that really helps. And that's what people see. Like they'll, you know, at the Four Seasons, it's not as though there are never any mistakes. Every day, there were mistakes in that hotel. And every morning, all of the managers would get together and go over everything that went wrong the day before because there was, you know, every glitch in this in the Four Seasons had a report of this is why this happened, this is what happened to the client, this is how the client is feeling now, and this is what, if any, other feedback is needed. And that just helps you see how to deal with things. Let's talk about no unfinished business and, and shifting away from a branding, um, I don't want to call it a vanity play, but a, but a branding kind of personal authority podcast like Five Star Council. And, and more of a podcast that's focused on referral sources and a little bit more closely aligned to you bringing in clients 
uh, into the front doors of, of the office. What was the genesis of that idea, uh, and how did you get that off the ground? So it was a couple different things. You know, one, by the time we started it, I'd already been doing uh, Five Star Council for almost, or for a year and a half at least. So the idea was, how do I spend more time with my referral sources? How do I help my clients and potential clients who are saying, well, I've got this problem, and it's not a problem I'm going to be able to solve for whatever reason. Either it's beyond, it's legal work that I don't want to do, I don't want to develop a new specialty like Medicaid planning or real estate or whatever it is, or it's just some area that's useful because they provide a service that's way outside of what we do, but it could be useful to somebody else. And the target audience for this really is those other referral sources. It's how do we help those referral sources find out what those problems are, help surface a problem long before it begins. And again, we're, we're just trying to make them better advisors. I don't want the CPA to be a financial advisor because we brought somebody on who's a financial advisor. I don't want the financial advisor to think he's a CPA because a CPA came on and talked about something. But it's really giving them every episode a sentence or two they can say in response to here, this problem has presented itself. I know, you know, oh, you know, client, I'm sorry to hear about that. I think what you're looking at is you know, blah, 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 blah. You should call this person who isn't John, it's whoever the guest was. You know, you heard, we had somebody come on and talk about certain things you can do with life insurance policies. Great, you can call that person about how you can do a life settlement to sell your policy and maybe get a better return than just the cash value. This is something you, that's out there. Yeah. I'm sorry, I didn't mean to cut you off. Oh, no, and it's just, it's a way of connecting people faster. And there's also the side benefits of we're going to send out links to these folks so that they can embed uh, the content on their website, hopefully give us a backlink, which drives SEO for us. But it's also a more effective way of having a conversation with somebody about what they're doing. And Sure, I'm happy to have coffee with people, but this way they can be in their office, I can be in mine. We're getting the same kind of interpersonal social development networking juice, but then we're recording this conversation and they get to look like a superstar at whatever their problem solving ability is. No, no one's going to be able to find your coffee conversations. Your podcast, however, will, at least for the foreseeable future, live on the internet somewhere to be found, to be downloaded, listened to, and same thing with Five Star Council, and, and to hopefully be embraced by people who might need to talk to you or the referral source or just otherwise people who can be in a position to make it worth your while to have recorded that podcast. Uh, how do you balance referral sources within your network versus referral sources outside? I guess, you know, would be referral sources. Are you focused mostly on people you know, or are you or your, your staff making cold calls to people who on paper seem like they could be? Good referral sources to have on to the podcast uh it's more on the existing referral sources though the way my practice works it kind of naturally develops a bigger set of referral sources because a client will come in again i'm usually the last advisor in so they my clients typically have either a cpa or a financial advisor if not both and so as part of our process i want to talk to those other advisors so we're asking for their names and their contact information so I can just reach out and have the 10 or 15 minute phone call with them. You know, hey, Bill and Sue are doing this. Just want to make sure you know we're here. We're going to think about this stuff. I don't know. We need to work together on this or I don't think there's much. But just making sure I'm talking to those other advisors, then they know who I am. And you know, the virtuous cycle goes from there. So in terms of cold calling, I'm I have a list in my bag of, you know, 40 or 50 people I would love to cold call as, you know, hey, I think we'd have some overlap. Here are some things if you'd like to grab coffee. But I just don't have time for all of them because I, I want to take care of my current referral sources because they're here. And, and that's the beauty of podcasting is you can you can co-write a blog post, you can co-write an article that you send to uh, an industry publication, legal industry or financial industry or whatever. But the podcast allows you to have a face to face conversation, get to know the person and you could still use it for marketing purposes. It really is 
I mean, it's the equivalent of a face-to-face conversation. It is a face-to-face conversation, um, but it's recorded for posterity's sake, and it's a marketing tool. And I think that's one of the reasons why podcasting is such a great way to build referral relationships, which is what you're doing with No Unfinished Business. Can you talk a little bit about how this podcast strategy, both Five Star Council and No Unfinished Business, how it's impacted your practice? Are you seeing results? How long does it take you to see Results because podcasts are uh, notorious for needing to gain some momentum. Unless you are a well known celebrity or a well known industry person, you are unlikely to get bo- you know, huge downloads your first few episodes. It, it's an uphill battle to get that, um, to get out there and to get people to download. So tell me a little bit about how long it took you to get some traction and what that traction looked like in terms of your practice and your own kind of personal branding. It's, I'll say it's hard for me to even calculate an ROI on it. It really is for both of them. You know, it's something that we keep doing because it, it still feels like it's working and it's low impact enough that I'm not worried about it being like, oh my gosh, we're like totally underwater on this. It, you know, we've got a subscription to a few uh, services that help us do this. But the recording equipment's been purchased. It's uh, it's all pretty easy. So, in terms of how do we see this? Well, for the no unfinished business, we record that with video as well as audio. Five Star Council has been always audio only, but we're taking those videos and we're putting them on YouTube. The YouTube videos then get embedded on our site. So we've seen site traffic go way up, and that's just Google saying, "Oh, well, you're you know." You're reinforcing that YouTube is important, so I think they're sending more people to us that way. I think that's an answer to your question. <laughs> Let me give you two two last questions. Uh, sure. First, what are some things that you wish you knew before you launched the podcast that you think might be helpful to lawyers or in-house marketers who are on the sidelines currently with podcast and want to get into the game? One of the biggest things is knowing, you know, why are you doing this podcast? It, nobody wants to hear three guys in a basement having beers and just talking about random stuff. Your audience is coming to your podcast for a reason. And no matter how deep a niche you think there is, there's still some audience for it. I mean, I, look, client service for lawyers. They're the people who are going to listen. It's not even all lawyers. It's small and medium sized firm lawyers. So, and that even then it's the ones who are willing to think about how do we do it better, but I need to give them something. Uh, the idea I was thought I was taught was what is the mountaintop we're trying to get them to? So it's building the four, you know, what is the law firm that was built by the founders of four seasons, Disney and Amazon look like, like we're trying to figure out what that law firm looks like. For no unfinished business, I'm trying to help advisors help their clients leave no unfinished business when they die. Let's make it easy for their clients. So what are the things that we can do to make it easy? How do we figure out those things? And by setting it up that way, it makes it so much easier to know this is a good guest for this podcast or this is a good topic. Is it helping us climb that mountain, whatever that mountain is for this podcast? I mean, for a while, I was like, oh, wouldn't it be great if I could get Seth Godin on because I like what he writes <laughs> and it'd be, you know, I've heard, oh, well, if you get to 100 episodes, then he'll finally consider. And the weird thing was, by the time I got to 100 episodes, I realized, I don't know if it makes sense to have him on. Like, I figured out, you know, you, you hear, oh, you have to figure out your voice. The voice is the same thing as figuring out the mountaintop. Like, how do you talk about whatever it is you're talking about? And at this point that goal has dropped away because I'm not really sure what the topic would be with him. I could, and I, I go back and forth on this somewhat, but it is less of a, a thing just because he, he does, he's not like that. Oh my God, I need to get him because he's going to bring this bit of knowledge. It's he's really big. He's got a lot of listeners, but just having some big shot podcaster come on, isn't going to, do anything for me? How is that going to help my listeners? So focusing on what are we doing? Where are we leading people has been one of the the big things. I wish I'd figured out a little sooner. Granted for five star, 
I kind of knew where I was going, but I didn't have really good words for it. That's an astute observation. I think it's something that you have to think about no matter what you are doing in terms of your content marketing or thought leadership marketing efforts is, is what's in it for the audience. And at a certain exactly. point, when you show up enough and with podcasts, it's easy because you're showing up every week or every other week, whatever it is, your audience begins to trust you. And that trust is it's fickle because one screw up and they could say, all right, look, I mean, who cares? I'm off. I'm going to find a different marketing podcast or a different client service podcast. Part of that trust is that you will bring to them. Once you've identified who you, what you stand for, what you're trying to do with your podcast, and you've got an audience that is tagging along because they're on that ride with you because they feel the same way. They have the same values. They see the world the same way. Once you start doing that, you have to be true to that North Star and you have to honor their trust by not pulling a sharp left turn and bringing on someone who has no connection to the topic, but is someone who you personally really wanted to get on to the podcast because they're a celebrity or because they can refer you cases. It's a fine line. You can find plenty right. of people who can both serve your audience and perhaps be a boon to your personal networking, your professional, or your professional networking. But you have to honor that trust. And, and it sounds so stupid because podcasts are normally free. And it's someone right. voluntarily deciding to listen for an hour or 45 minutes to you and your guest. But that's what audience building is, is trust. And people listen to Five Star Council or they listen to No Unfinished Business because they trust John. After all of these episodes, they trust that what they're going to get out of that podcast is what – is going to be consistent with what they've gotten out from previous podcasts. They know John as a certain lawyer who has a certain view of the world, and we're going to take on his view of the world through this podcast. And if he leads us astray, Seth Godin is a great example. He's a, a monster in terms of prominence and authority in marketing. But what's a small law firm going to get from him that is going to speak about their client service? Maybe something tangential, but it's not the same as having someone from Disney or Four Seasons on the show to give out that knowledge. It's, again, consistent with the mission of the podcast that you've carved out over your 100-plus episodes of the podcast. Absolutely. F uh, final question, and this is a personal question. I've heard you introduce yourself as proprietor of Strohmeyer yes. Law. Not the founder, not the owner, proprietor. I am so curious. As someone who deals with words, thousands of words at a time – uh, why did you choose to introduce yourself as proprietor? Uh, one, it's a little, you know, nobody uses it. Almost nobody uses it. It goes back to when I was growing up, there was a little coffee shop near my house and the, you know, the guy, the owner had business cards or the proprietor had business cards and it just said, you know, first name, Willie, no last name. And then it just said proprietor underneath it. And it always stuck with me. If I still had that card, I would. it would be one of the ones that I just kind of keep around for motivation. But I really like the simplicity of it, the fact that, look, I don't just own it. I didn't just push it out to sea. I'm still kind of propagating it on a daily basis. It's here because I am here. It's, it's interesting. It does conjure up like a little small town feel. You know, there's John, proprietor of John's Steak and Ribs or, you know, yep. John's Bar down the corner. Um, it does have a little bit of a small town feel and, and perhaps that's, that's helpful when you're talking about estates and trusts and you are trying to be, uh, come across as trustworthy very early on in the relationship. Uh, John, where can people learn more about you if they're curious about the client service things that you're talking about or your Stromeyer Law? Where can they go to download the podcast, find you online, et cetera, et cetera? Uh, if you have thoughts or if you want to learn more about client service, episode 66 of Five Star Council, after 65 episodes, I went and pulled everything back together. So episode 66 is a great place to start. You can kind of fan out from there across all of the interviews. If you're looking to reach out to me otherwise, I am on Twitter at John the Lawyer, or you can reach me at Strohmeyer Law. There's all sorts of contact information on there. Finally, uh, askjohnaquestion.com will take you to Calendly where I'm happy to schedule a call with you and just chat about things. Those are great social media handles and domains. Were you like waiting for Twitter to launch and then you got on like the first minute so you can get John the lawyer at Twitter? That's a, that's a fantastic feed. A I, fantastic uh, yeah, handle. I picked that one up. I picked – I was in Austin at the time and so I got John the lawyer at in 2009. That's incredible. That's incredible. John, thanks again for your time and best of luck with the podcasts and the legal practice.
Awesome. Wayne, thank you so much for having me on. <laughs>